who are tuning in, uh, you know, we, we know, especially for educators often, you know, sometimes you can, you can be for, here for a session for, for 30 or 40 minutes and then, you know, life calls sometimes. So if you do miss the, the end of it, we will have the recording up on the Shifting Schools or the Reimagine WAED site. Usually we turn that around in about 24 hours. So the session is being recorded. Um, and we, you know, I, I get the pleasure of just sort of watching the chat and helping to moderate that. So if you're sharing questions or thoughts or just saying like, thank you, Dr. Thornhill, I'm going to remember that. Um, if you are sharing in the chat, the important thing to remember when you click chat, there's going to be a blue box. The default, unfortunately, is that it says panelists. You want to make sure that you have clicked that and you have selected panelists and attendees so everybody gets to uh, see what you've shared. And I'll also just point out, you know, as educators, we know all too well when we've invested a lot of our time and energy into creating resources or developing ideas and how important it is to attribute that source. So if I move my head out of the way, um, again, there, uh, those of you on Twitter, if you are not already following Dr. Nadine Thornhill, I would highly recommend you do. And I also have the website just above my shoulder too. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is, you know, again, if you're on Instagram, Dr. Thornhill, I know I've said this to you before, but I really mean it. You know, in terms of folks who are sharing educational content on Instagram, I feel like you have set the bar so ridiculously high. Like, I love the work that you do with Instagram Live, the short little snippets of um, just digestible wisdom is a true, true gift. You have profoundly made me rethink, um, you know, the role of, of sex ed in education as well as health. Uh, you know, what does it mean to have a healthy relationship? Such an important conversation to have. So again, thanks, uh, thanks to, to you for making some time for us today. I'm going to mute myself um, just so I can, you know, scribble away some notes um, and, and not distract others. So again, folks, please do feel free to use the chat. If you're using the chat, you want to click that blue button and please kindly make sure that it says panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your message. Without further ado, thank you so much again, Dr. Thornell. Well, thank you for that glowing introduction, and I hope that I live up to uh, that set of expectations. Just before we begin, I want to let people know, I, I know I can't see you, but hello, and thank you so much for giving me your time and your attention. So I'm just going to let you know that uh, when I do Zoom calls, I don't have my headphones in, so you may hear some ambient noises from my environment. Um, I live next to a somewhat busy street, so you may hear traffic. I uh, also have my family with me. As, uh, as we already mentioned, I'm, I am in the Eastern time zone, so it's evening. I have my partner home. I have my, uh, my son home. They're moving about the house, and I just have like a squeaky chair. So if you are sensitive to noise, I just wanted to let you know that those are noises that might uh, might crop up. Um, in addition, I have this overhead light that I can see is casting this weird beam of light down the side of my face. And so if that is um, bothersome to you, if you want to, um, I don't, I guess you can't really turn me off, but if you want to make me small, then it will be less intrusive. I'm going to very, very shortly bring up slides. And so I believe I'll just be a little teeny square in the corner of your screen. And so hopefully that will be bothering you as much. And yeah, just, you know, take care of your needs and pay attention to your body during the presentation. It is being recorded. And so if you need to step away, if you need to grab a snack, if you've just, you know, had a long day and you can't take any more in, it's no problem at all. The recording will be here for you whenever you need it. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. And hang on, oh, sorry. Okay, let's get into the presentation. No, I do not wanna update my software right now. That is very poor timing. All right, and can folks just let me know um, in the chat if they can see a slide that says harnessing the power of sex ed? Looks all good by me. Looks all good. Yes, yes, you can. Okay, fantastic. 
So without further ado, welcome to Harnessing the Power of Sex Ed. I am your host, facilitator, Dr. Nadine Thornhill, EDD. And I am a sexuality educator. I have been doing this work for, I'm coming up on 16 years in 2021. Most of my work focuses on child and adolescent sexuality. And I have a private practice where I work primarily with parents, caring adults, and teachers to really help them have open, honest, transformative conversations with the kids and teenagers in their life about all like various aspects of sexuality. And I'm gonna be talking more about my work as we go through the presentation. Okay, so what we're gonna cover, the introduction, we're in that now. We're going to talk a little bit about what is sex ed? I'm gonna to talk to you about why we are all sex educators, whether we are aware of that or not. And then I'm gonna close out by talking a little bit about how we can create sex positive classrooms. And we'll close it off with some Q and A, but I also want to invite you to post your questions as we're going through. And at the end of each segment, I'll just take a short break and you know answer any questions that we might have about what we've just covered. All right. So I would love to tell you a bit about my, um, my values, some of my values, my perspectives and my biases because in doing work like sex education where we're talking so much about um, you know, people's individual experiences, I think it's important for me to be upfront about the fact that I also have a set of values that I work with. I also have my own perspective that I bring to this work and I do have biases. And so um, I just want you to be aware that, you know, this is where I'm coming from or this is part of where I'm coming from. You may be coming from a different place and that is okay. Everyone sort of has their own lens through which they view sexuality. And these are some of the things that influence mine. So in terms of identity, I am a black queer neurodivergent cis woman. So black is my race and ethnicity. Um, queerness is basically how I experience attraction and uh, operating relationships. I don't really find that my attraction is based on a person's gender that's sort of irrelevant in terms of who I, I find myself attracted to and wanting to have sex with. Although I am married to a cisgender man, we are currently in a monogamous uh, relationship. And so I often present as straight, but I'm not. I am neurodivergent. I have uh, attention deficit disorder. And that, you know, aspects of that crop up in the way I do my work. It crops up in the way I present, just something to be aware of. And I also have uh, various mental health diagnoses. I have been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and depression. Those are also often comorbid or things that go along with having attention deficit disorder. So who knows what causes what, but, you know, that's my brain. And cis woman just means that I was assigned female at birth and that is the gender with which I identify. My, the pronouns I use are she and her. I'm okay with people using um, gender neutral pronouns, but pretty much I, the only ones I'm not a fan of are he, him, his, if you're referring to me, but anything else is fine. I am a settler um, first generation Canadian. So what that means is that I was born in um, land that is legally known as Canada, um, settler because I am not indigenous to this land on which I live. And um, Canada is unceded um, First Nations territory. There are various First Nations that inhabited this land before uh, European settlers came here. And I am not of European descent. However, my parents were immigrants. They came here. They also lived on this unceded territory. So that's part of my perspective. Um, and my parents, although they are immigrants from Bermuda and Barbados, those are also colonies. And so my parents and my family lineage um, is connected to slavery. It's connected to Caribbean slavery and then slavery in Bermuda, which is a British colony. 
Some of my privileges, I enjoy economic privilege. I have had economic privilege my whole life. Um, I've never had to struggle financially. I have body privilege in the sense that I am, I am thin and I am able-bodied. So those are some of the body privileges that I have. I have the privilege of citizenship. I'm born in Canada. I live in Canada. I'm a citizen. Uh, I have all the rights of citizenship here. And as I said, I am straight presenting. And so generally, if I don't tell people that I'm queer, they don't know that I'm queer and there is a privilege in that. One of my uh, core values as a sexuality educator is that I am uh, what people would often describe as sex positive or sometimes sex neutral. And so sex positivity is a, it's a framework that's sort of emerged in opposition to the idea that sex is inherently dangerous, sex is something to be feared, sex is something to be controlled, or that um, there are ways of experiencing or expressing sexuality that are better or worse than others. Um, this is not to say that I think that all sexual experiences are good or that um, we should all be having sex all the time. That's not what I believe, but what I aim to do in my work is to give people information and permission to explore and express their sexualities in ways that feel authentic to who they are in ways that serve their well-being and ways that serve their right to pleasure providing that uh, that sex those sexual experiences are consensual uh, when they involve other people and that those sexual experiences are not um, actively harmful to other folks. I strive to be queer inclusive in my work and hopefully you will see that as we go through the presentation. In my work, I tend to prioritize people's lived experience. And basically what that means is that if I am working with someone, be it um, you know, a group of teachers, be it you know, working one-on-one -on -one with a teen, what I'm gonna prioritize is what you know about yourself and what you've experienced. That is always going to trump anything that I've read. Uh, to me, that is more important than you know any research or any study I've had. It's the person who's sitting in front of me and what they're telling me about who they are, what they've experienced, what they need. Um, that's always my priority as an educator. I am pro-choice. So I am pro-choice in the traditional sense of, you know, I believe in reproductive choice. And so I believe that when a person is um, facing a pregnancy, that they have a right to choose um, between abortion, parenting, or adoption. And I also believe in providing as much support for that person, regardless of the choice that they make. And I believe that it is um, that person's right to make the decision that is right, is best for them and their lives in that in that moment. But I am also pro-choice in the sense that the way I approach sex education is that I try as much as possible not to tell people what they need to do with their lives or their bodies. I'm here to share information and then I invite people to take whatever information is relevant to them and to use it in whatever way they feel will best serve them in that moment, um, down the line, long term, whatever they want. So I'm not here, so I am not one of those sex educators, say, who would walk into a classroom of, you know, high school students and be like, hey, kids, use a condom. I am the sex educator who would come in and say, okay, let's talk about safer sex. Condoms are an option. Dental dams are an option. Here are all your options. Ask me any questions. And then you make the decision that's best for you. And finally, I am I'm not finally, I have two more points. Um, I am pro consent, like pro, 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 pro consent. If you, um, you know, want to touch someone else's body, if you want to engage with someone else, then I believe strongly that you need to be, you need to have that person's consent. I understand that because we are talking about teaching and classrooms and children, that there are some nuances to consent and a child's capacity to consent to certain things, because we know that children don't always have um, the cognitive or developmental skills to make the same decisions as adults. But I still do believe that um, it is important to teach kids and encourage them to develop those, um, those consent skills. And finally, I am pro-pleasure. And I don't see pleasure as, you know, the thing that you earn. 
by working really hard. I think that, I, at least for me, pleasure is central to the work I do. It is central to the outcomes that I hope the people I work with, um, you know, achieve and realize. It's also just central to the way that I do my work. So even when I'm just sitting in my office and I'm like, oh, I'm just like typing and it's kind of boring. I'm like, how can I make this more pleasurable for myself? Because I think that, you know, pleasure is life. And I, I sincerely believe we all deserve to experience as much pleasure as we can while still living our lives and, you know, like doing the things we need to do. So not in a hedonistic way, but just in a, you know, we, I think we deserve to feel good as much as we can. Cause there's just like a lot of stuff in life that's going to hit us. That's not going to be great. Hence 2020. Um, yes. Okay. So I've been talking a lot about myself. I would love to know a little bit about y'all. Uh, so if you want to pop in the chat, and I know some of you already have, and tell me where you are in the world. And because I'm in Canada and I'm not always familiar with, I'm not familiar with all the regions outside. I'm not even familiar with all the regions in Canada, but I'm definitely not familiar with all the regions outside of, the can of Canada. So if you want to tell me, like if you're in the States, tell me, you know, maybe your town or city and your state. Um, and you could also let me know uh, who do you teach? So, you know, what age are they um, maybe, or what grade are they in? And I would love to know, you know, what you teach them about. What subjects do you cover? And I'm going to pop in the chat and see what's up. And again, just a reminder, because I know some folks joined us a little bit late, uh, when you are sharing information in the chat, please do make sure that you've clicked that blue box and that it says panelists and attendees so that everybody can see what you're sharing. Thanks for that. A friend of mine is here who lives in Sarasota, Florida. Um, yeah, this is an amazing friend of mine who teaches folks about sexual violence prevention. Um, you know, particularly high school students, but folks nine and up. So love that. Seattle. I went to Seattle for the first time last year, a little over a year ago, and just loved it. Fifth grade, all subjects, and really focusing on SEL. We've got some, oh, I've got someone else here from Toronto. Oceanside, California. Love it. I did uh, my doctorate in California. Used to teach elementary school, everything from K to five. And now um, I think I see homeschooling. Bellingham and the uh, curriculum director from Mount Baker School District. Uh, where is Bellingham? I don't think I know where that is. Grade seven and eight science. Oh, someone joining from Washington DC and they teach seventh and ninth graders at church and community school. You teach the OWL curriculum. Okay, so I, um, I did the, I wrote the revised edition of the OWL 10 to 12 curriculum. So that's really cool. Got a certified sexual health educator in Nanaimo. This is another, um, this is somebody else I know. That's awesome. I love to see all the sex educators here. And I hope what I'm going to uh, teach and share is not going to be redundant for you. Hopefully you'll still take something away from that. Bellingham is close to the Canadian border. Oh, you're, you're practically like, you're practically one of us. Amazing. So I teach, oh, dance. You teach dance to children six to 13. Um, if you ever want to teach me dance, I love to dance, but I am not. Killed. Um, I stopped taking actual lessons when I was 12, I think. Uh, we've got an early childhood educator, someone from Whitehorse, incredible. Your demographic is focusing on 19 plus, but you're open to all ages in consent, contraception options, and healthy relationships. Oh, thank you for saying I'm a great dancer. Like I can, I can, you know, turn up on a dance floor if I need to, if we're just freestyling, but like I don't have any choreographed moves. Awesome. Okay. So we have a real mix of folks here today and folks who are teaching different subjects. So I will say that I've tailored this presentation to um, more towards folks who are not sex educators or who are not necessarily working um you know, in sex education directly, but, but hopefully you will still learn something. Um, and definitely if folks have, you know, things they want to add or contribute um, to what I'm saying, like, please, again, pop into the chat and, uh, and do that. That's fantastic. Okay. 
So let's talk about what is sex ed. So this is going to be a really brief overview where we scratch the surface because honestly, I could teach like a university course on what sex ed is and wouldn't cover everything. So we're going real basic, but you'll get the gist of it. Okay, so sex ed or sexuality education is teaching and learning about all the things that inform our sexual experiences and behaviors. So what are some of those things? Well, sex ed includes information about bodies and that can be, and again, this is not a comprehensive list, but some of those things are uh, which body parts we consider sexual, what we call those body parts, how we clean those body parts, how we keep those parts of our body and uh, those you know, parts of our anatomy and biology healthy or as healthy as we can how our bodies and those parts of our bodies change throughout our lives and we know that that will influence a lot of other things about how we move and function through the world and how we feel about our bodies sex ed includes identity and you know um particularly when we talk about sex ed, we often think about our gender identity and our sexual identity and those are things that can really influence how we see ourselves how other people see us um, what we might wear and how we present our bodies to the world. So how we, you know, groom ourselves and adorn ourselves, how we relate to other people, what society expects from us and the roles that we might take on in our relationships. And there I'm not only talking about, you know, our romantic relationships, but really any of the relationships that we have are often influenced by our identity, how we present them and um, who we understand ourselves to be. We're not done. Sex ed also includes relationships, um, how we express affection, how we express love, how we experience attraction, or even whether or not we experience uh, certain forms of attraction, because not everybody experiences all the forms of attraction. Um, rela and relationships um, influence how families come together and who the people are in our families, and really how we connect to other human beings. Sex ed often includes emotions, how we feel. That's just another way of saying emotions. Um, how those feelings affect our boundaries, how those feelings affect our desires, how we process our feelings, what we do with them, and how we express our feelings. And then sex ed also includes sex, like sex we have with other people, sex we have with ourselves, like masturbation, um, all the things that we would like traditionally think of in sex ed. And then, like I said, that's just scratching the surface, but in essence, sexuality is the human experience. It is um, just intrinsic to the way that we live our lives, move through the world, interact with each other. It's, it's, it's at play, it's there. And that's why sexuality cannot be taught adequately in one lesson. Um, you know, I often have requests from, you know, really well-intentioned educators who are just doing the best they can. They're like, I have one period this entire year can you come in and teach my students about sex like about sex i'm like no I, like i'll do what i can but absolutely i cannot teach them everything they need to know in an hour or even two um sexuality can't even be caught adequately in one unit sometimes uh you know there are schools where they're luckier and they have more time and they have you know a couple of weeks to cover human sexuality i'm like better, but can't do it. Uh, um, and it can't even be covered in one subject. So again, um, you know, I know in my undergrad, I took a couple of human sexuality courses and still we only just scratched the surface. And that was, um, I'm trying to do quick math in my head, but you know, three hours a week for six, three hours a week for 16 weeks. And again, we only scratched the surface. I did an entire doctorate um, where I focused on, on sexuality and barely scratch the surface. So um, I say this not to put pressure on people, but to actually say you can take some pressure off yourselves and don't feel like if sex ed is something that you are covering explicitly, not explicit, that was a bad adjective. If that is something that you are actually teaching um, and you're doing it, you know, in a school where oftentimes there isn't a lot of time, don't put a lot of pressure on yourself to try and do it all. 
because it's not possible. Sexual learning is something that happens, is it's happening constantly and it needs to be happening constantly. Um, okay. So before we move on to the next section, we are all sex educators. Are there any questions or comments? You know, and, and uh, Dr. Thornhill, as folks have time to think about whether or not they have a question at this point, uh, I, I just want to point out, I really appreciated in your introduction, you know, the idea of, of normalizing, introducing ourselves and talking about privilege um, and, and talking about bias. You know, certainly we all carry bias and I, I just sort of love that modeling. Uh, and I'm wondering if there was, you know, a point or an aha moment where you thought, oh, this is something that I want to incorporate into the way um, that I have an introduction. Because, you know, as you were doing that, for me, I was like, you know, I've never actually seen someone go through an introduction um, where they, they discuss privilege. And I do think that normalization of sharing or discussing or exploring privilege is just super important. So uh, again, if, if that's something that has evolved organically, yeah, uh, you know, I didn't mean to set you up to be like, tell oh, me about that no, profound okay. moment. <laughs> um, it, it's certainly not something that I've been doing from day one. So yeah, it probably is an evolution. You know, I've, um, I've always had some sort of an introduction and I think that has come about from different things, you know, um, having done this for, you know, a long time and really, you know, facilitating workshops where I've been forced to confront some of my biases in conversations um, with the folks that I was with, uh, that I was working with. Um, I will say that in this year in particular, um, you know, really being in conversation with a lot of people around, like issues around race and racial bias and racism and sort of um, in that regard, you know, being a black person and feeling like I was on, you know, the other end and the more harmful end sometimes of people's um, biases and assumptions and sometimes feeling, you know, very harmed by the fact that certain people didn't think that they had biases or didn't think that, you know, their experience gave them a certain perspective, which was not a universal perspective. Um, you know, it was also a wake up call for me to be like, hey, girlfriend, like also check in with yourself and think about, you know, where are you doing that? Where might you be doing that same thing um, of just assuming that certain things are universal and um, are just, you know, inherent and in the way things are as opposed to, no, this is your experience and your bias creeping into your work. So no, um, I, yeah, I really evolved over time. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. You know, and again, it just kind of struck me going into your next sec uh, section here about, you know, we're all sex educators. You know, I was thinking, you know, we're, we are also all educators when it comes to privilege and bias too. So thank you again for that modeling. I just feel like that's a great teachable moment. Thank you for oh, that. Thank you so much. And um, thank you again for framing that it that way and um, not as me just being self-involved and talking about myself. Um, so yes, we are all sex educators and we are all sex educators because, because sexuality is such an intrinsic part of our lives, um, whether we are doing it consciously or not, we are giving youth messages and ideas about um, let's just what it is to be a human and part of being a human is being sexual. So there are two ways we teach sex ed. There are actually infinite ways we teach sex ed, but for the purposes of this presentation, um, we're going to talk about two of the ways that we teach sex ed. And one is through like fact evidence-based teaching. And again, this is the more, I would say overt form of sex education um, where you are intentionally going to someone and saying, I'm going to share some facts or some evidence with you about some aspect of sex or sexuality. And then there is the social and contextual based teaching. And this is the teaching that we are doing whether we mean to be doing it or not. We can do it intentionally, but we can also do it unintentionally. And we do do it unintentionally. And that's just the teaching we do by living and then 
um, the youth in our classroom or the youth in our, you know, in our lives, in our families, in our communities, whatever, are just watching and emulating and learning again how to be humans based largely on watching other people be humans. Um, yeah, that's the social contextual based learning. Okay, so these are some examples of uh, fact or evidence-based sex ed that you might do with youth or really with anybody. Um, you know, so naming body parts, including the genitals, you can just have like a diagram of a body and be like, you know, nose, shoulder, arm, leg, vulva, testicles, kneecap, foot. Um, describing stages of the menstrual cycle is fact evidence-based sex ed. Uh, giving the dates of a historical event like the Stonewall riot. Uh, giving a clinical definition of puberty. And so when I say clinical definition, we're talking more about like, this is what's happening biologically when someone go like starts puberty. There's, you know, the pituitary, pituitary gland fires off, hormones start flowing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, naming of the sexual organs. So sometimes we have those great diagrams and we're like, these are the ovaries and these are the fallopian tubes and this is the vas deferens, et cetera. Um, diagramming the clitoris, which admittedly I haven't seen a lot in classrooms, but I'm starting to see it and I'm loving it. And I, it's just available on my desk. I'm going to show you. This is a clitoris. This is what it would look like. So you could have a diagram of this little thing. This little like end bit here is the part that's on the outside of the body that um, folks can often see and touch, but there's a whole internal structure, just FYI. Um, you know, talking about the effectiveness rates of condoms, talking about the stages of pregnancy, uh, reviewing the age of consent laws wherever you are in the world, giving a legal definition of sexual harassment. Um, note, a legal definition and someone's experience of sexual harassment may not be the same thing, um, but there is often a legal definition. Um, sharing statistics on teens and sexting. So again, um, this is, you know, information that's been researched, documented, we're just you know, giving them, we're giving them the facts, we're giving them the straight dope. Social and contextual sex ed was harder for me to come up with concrete examples, because like I said, um, it kind of happens a lot, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. But basically, the social contextual sex ed is information that affects how youth make sense of their internal and external experiences. And so something I often say is that I think it's important not to make the mistake that because that if we don't talk to youth and even children about sexuality, that it's not happening, that they're not making observations, that they're not having, like I said, external experiences and internal experiences. So a really simple example I can give is that something that I often um, recommend to you know, parents or folks who teach young children when they ask me, you know, like, how do I start sex ed? Like, when do I start? What do I do? Is I will say, you could start by teaching them the names of their body parts and just including their genitals in that. And sometimes I will have people who will push back and say, well, they, they're too young. Like they're too young to know the word penis. They're too young to know the word clitoris. Um, they're too young to you know, know the word testicles. And I will say, they know they have those body parts because it's literally on them. Like they can see that those body parts are there. And so not naming them is not suddenly going to erase their knowledge of their own body. Um, and that is true in many instances. So kids are watching, they're, they're having their own internal feelings. Um, you know, they're, especially nowadays, they're surrounded by media, a lot of which um, is giving them some kind of information and giving them ideas about all sorts of um, aspects of sexuality. And so, yeah, we can give them information that will sort of help them put that in like a container and understand and start to understand what's happening. When we don't do that, they just usually make up their own explanations and have their own ideas. And I think often if we think back to our own childhoods, um, we can probably, a lot of us can probably remember, you know, seeing something, hearing something, feeling something that was connected to sexuality and having some idea about what it was, whether that idea was accurate or not. Um, social and contextual sex ed is also information that affects how youth develop their own sexual values, norms, 
and self-concept. So again, going back to that idea or to that, you know, suggestion of talking to, you know, just, you know, having them name their body parts and, you know, naming the genitals the way they would any other body part. Um, you can do that. And that may lead to you developing one set of, like a certain set of values around, you know, what are my genitals and, you know, what are my themes and my values about my genitals relative to the other parts of my body? You can also not tell them the names of that. And they may develop certain values based on the fact that what's up with these body parts that like don't have a name? Why these parts um, that can still influence some of their body values or even some of their communication values around sexuality. So as I said, social and contextual sex ed can happen through direct teaching and learning. We can be intentional about what we're trying to teach youth about sexuality. And then it also happens through modeling and through your day-to-day -day interaction with youth. Um, so another example, as I said, I am, you know, I live with my partner, we're married, um, we have a romantic and sexual relationship. My kid has been exposed to that his entire life. He lives with us. He sees it. He doesn't see everything. Um, there's a lot to our relationship he doesn't see, but he does see us interacting day to day. So that is going to inform um, some of his ideas and values about um, relationships, or at least about, you know, our relationship. So in short, youth learn about sexuality from what we say and do, but they also learn from what we don't say and don't do because they are developing sexually. And so, like I said, not saying things and not acknowledging it doesn't stop it from happening. Um, sexual development isn't a thing that just happens like boom, when they hit puberty. Um, there's this idea in our culture of the like sexual awakening. And I'm not saying that that's not what happens ever for anybody, but what we understand is that generally speaking, it is a process of ongoing development in the same way that, you know, it's a process of ongoing intellectual development and emotional development and physical development. You know, you don't, you're not a baby. And then one day, boom, you're just suddenly a teenager and you like grow a whole bunch and completely change. It's gradual, it's ongoing, um, it's iterative. Uh, it's, it doesn't go in a straight line. You know, there are games, I don't even want to say games, like, you learn something, you might forget something, you may have to have an experience several times to, you know, get the lesson. It's just, it's life. It's, I'm gonna keep saying that, it's life. Something to remember uh, that I think is important to remember is that um, as educators is that all students are going through their own process of sexual development. So it's something that is happening to them while they're with us in the room, even if we aren't their sex ed teacher. Um, all these things are emerging and developing and then and they're learning and they're changing and they're like bodies are, are growing and, um, you know, new complex, like new emotion, they're discovering new emotions. Um, they're learning things about themselves. Like that's all happening. And like I said, it's just while they're sitting there in math class doing fractions, it, it's happening. Um, so yeah, so again, whether it's intentional or not, generally speaking, we as adults and also their peers, um, and also media just again, living, uh, will give youth messages about, you know, gender norms, gender expression and gender roles. Uh, they get a lot of messages about bodies and body image and body image messages about relationship norms and expectations. And I should have put norms in quotations because uh, something else that I don't really believe in is the idea of normal. I believe that there's a, you know, sometimes there's what is more or less common, but I think normal has this connotation of that's okay. And then the things that are not that are not okay. And like I said, not really super concerned with you being like everybody else, I'm concerned with you doing what works for you. And so if something is working for you, you're not harming other people, then like, it, I think it's kind of irrelevant whether it's common or not. Um, we give youth messages about the value of consent, 
of pleasure and boundaries. And those are all things that come into play if we are navigating sexual relationships at any point in our lives or any kind of relationship. Um, we give youth messages about social taboos and we also give youth messages just about human diversity um, and inclusion. All right. So next I'm gonna move on and talk about creating sex positive classrooms. And before I check in for questions or comments, I just wanna say shout out to y'all teachers, educators, folks out here. Um, it's, it's an intense job. And in my opinion, teaching, particularly teaching youth, particularly those of you who are doing it like on a full-time near daily basis, it's, it's so much. Um, you know, it's so much emotional output. It is so much like actual work. And I know sometimes when I'm doing trainings or sitting in presentations and I'm, you know, learning about new skill sets, sometimes it can feel overwhelming, particularly when, um, you know, sometimes I already feel like, oh my gosh, like I feel like I'm doing so much already. And I know that teachers generally speaking, you do so much for your students already. And so A, I just wanna say, like, I see you, even though I can't see you see you. Um, I see you, I really appreciate the work you're doing. Um, and as we're going through these, if, you know, I'm offering these suggestions and you feel like, oh my gosh, like this is so much and this is so much more, um, I invite you to just, you know, sort of take a breath um, you know, take a moment and, you know, just think that like, you don't have to do all of these things tomorrow if you haven't been doing them already. Um, you could maybe just start with one or two things that you feel like you could start incorporating and start there. And again, there's a recording and then you can come back and pick up some more things. Like my hope is that any of the suggestions I'm gonna make are going to have a positive effect and make a positive difference. Um, but I just, yeah, teachers are doing the most. And I know that particularly in the US, you know, teachers are not always given the resources that they need to be able to really do this, this job, um, but they're still doing it, which is incredible. So yeah, uh, pat yourself on the back, teachers and educators, cause yeah. You're changing the world. Uh, yeah, are there any questions or comments? We we did have a, a question from Rachel. And again, just a reminder, folks, if you're sharing with us in the chat, please do make sure that you've clicked that blue button that's going to say panelists and attendees so that we can, uh, everybody gets access to your questions. Uh, and, you know, and, and Dr. Thornhill, I, I love that reminder of how, you know, the intensity of the emotional labor that is teaching, that's always been true, but you're right, even more so now. Um, and I, I loved how you, you pointed out this idea that, you know, we all, you know, feel an intense sense of attachment to our subject areas or to what it is that we are teaching. But the reality that as that student, as that learner is there, you know, the their identity, the dynamic that they have in terms of developing relationships with others, that process is ongoing right there, you know, during that, that lesson. Um, and I think, you know, the reality is that takes the priority, not just for teens or young learners, but for us as well, for adults, you know, it's our friendships, our families, our partnerships that, you know, those are always going to be on the front burner. And I think it's really important just to acknowledge that. So thanks for making that point. Um, and so, you know, Rachel asks a question, uh, you know, mentions totally agrees, you know, that idea of, of having the biologically accurate uh, terminology is, is really important and, and research is behind that as well. Uh, but Rachel asks, you know, I'm concerned that actually if I am doing that all the time, um, I, she, she says here, I will be called to the district office. Um, and certainly, you know, it's interesting, Dr. Thornhill pointing out, pointing out that we should use the accurate terminology that that's somehow controversial is pretty wild you know we would not be arguing against that in any other academic subject area for for sure so i'm wondering uh, you know do you have any words of wisdom for 
educators out there who are feeling like, I would love to do this. I agree with mm-hmm. you. Research is on our side, um, but it might be problematic for me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's actually something that I should have acknowledged. Uh, right off the top is that because I work independently, I have a lot more freedom in that regard to, you know, teach in an uncompromising way as opposed to, you know, folks who may be constrained by, um, you know, rules or guidelines of a school board or a school district. Um, And even I sometimes come up against that when I wanted to go into a school and then I've been told, well, you can't say these words or you can't talk about this subject. Again, I have the luxury of saying like, well, I'm doing it or it's not happening if I want to. Um, You had to have an election to get a sex ed curriculum passed. Fortunately, it passed. I'm thrilled that it passed. That's fantastic. Um, So what I would say is if you feel like you have the capacity, um, that is certainly advocacy that you can take on. you know, going to the board, going to the parents, and maybe coming to them with some of that research. And that is um, an instance where research can be helpful. And talking about how, you know, these are techniques and strategies that can really um, be effective harm reduction strategies, you know, so, you know, speaking frankly about body parts, um, you know, having a more comprehensive sex ed curriculum if you have the capacity to take that on, which you may not. Um, And if you cannot get people on side, and then it's, I would say, a think about what you can do. You can't do everything. um, And you may look at it from a harm reduction perspective. And so, you know, take whatever it is you are permitted to teach them and whatever you it is you are allowed to say. Um, And I would say what you can do is really focus on how you're delivering that information um, and see if you can find ways to, you know, reassure and let students know that even if you can't talk about it specifically, you know, letting them know that, you know, whatever feelings they might be having um, is okay, that being curious about bodies is okay. And that is, you know, part of growing up and it's part of, you know, even once you're grown up, that these are things that, that, you know, we still experience Um, to really, you know, do what you can to encourage that curiosity around bodies, around relationships, around communication, to model it where you can. So even if you can't um, sit down with your class and say, all right, um, let's talk about sexual consent in a really straightforward manner. I can't because I'm not allowed to say the word penis to you, or I'm not allowed to reference um, teenagers having sex with each other. Um, you can still look for ways to maybe model consent in non-sexual ways. So they're still getting that learning. Um, you know, and again, to just do what you can. Um, and something else you can do is Again, if you have the capacity, you know, you you may find that there are certain parents or there are certain people in the administration who are on your side. And so if you had something, say, like a resource list that's OK, I can't bring these books or I can't bring these videos or I can't bring these resources into my classroom. However, if anyone is interested, I have this available for you um, that I, and I can give this to you and then, you know, those parents who are interested or, you know, people on the administration who are curious and maybe want to have a look at them, um, you can really sort of facilitate access to those resources. And you never know. Um, You know, I do a lot of advocacy for sex ed here in Ontario, and I know that that's uh, a different beast than what some folks might be dealing with in other parts of the world. But it's, yeah, it's a lot and it can be really frustrating um, when you know you can be doing more and you want to be talking more freely than you are, you're allowed to do, but you can still be a really positive influence on kids. You know, one thing that I'll I'll point out too, and, you know, I I feel like it's easier maybe for for me to kind of, uh, you know, uh, refer back to your work because, um, you know, sometimes that's awkward to do, but, you know, often I share, and I'm I'm putting the link to it in the chat right now, Dr. Thornhill's Everybody Curious work, because I also think sometimes, um, you know, if we're advocating for change within our own 
teams. You know, I love that we started this session talking about bias because sometimes there's a bias within that team dynamic and sometimes pointing toward an, an external service provider or an external resource where it's like, hey, this isn't just my opinion. Take a look at what those conversations can look and sound like. Um, you know, because the other thing is, I think sometimes when people think about uh, a change when it comes to sex ed and when we're talking about you know, doing more progressive work. Sometimes people get really fearful of what that means. And I, what I really appreciate about that Everybody Curious series is just, you know, you, you watch that and it's, wow, actually talking about consent is pretty seamless, you know? And I realized I had never had those conversations as a, a youngster long, long ago. Um, you know, and, and I think if I had mentioned like even to my parents, you know, that's something that's talked about in classrooms today. I think they would sort of be like, what? Could that even sound like? So sometimes just sharing um, those examples, I really find that video series to be such a powerful resource. Um, so maybe maybe that's just a good one to pass on and say, look, see, it's not that scary. Thank you. Yeah, and and oftentimes people's reticence comes from fear. Their reluctance comes from fear. Um, you know, we do live in a society that historically has given us messages that sexuality is dangerous, is fraught, and definitely um, not suitable for children. And so a lot of us, and I include myself in that, have really internalized this, like have internalized these ideas of like, oh my gosh, like the only way that you can ever have a discussion with a like with a child or with a teenager about sexuality is, you know, in a way that's like exploitative and inappropriate and harmful. And if that's the only idea you have, then that reticence, even though it may be based on an incorrect set of assumptions, is not necessarily coming from a bad, evil place. It's just, it's fear and it's ignorance. And I mean, ignorance literally in the sense of just not knowing, but still frustrating to deal with. So uh, yeah, I, I feel any of you out there who are like, oh, I just want to teach comprehensive sex ed, let me. Yeah, you should be allowed to. Okay, so let's talk about ways that we can create sex positive classrooms. Some of these uh, will apply more to a physical classroom. Someday, fingers crossed, we'll be able to be around each other again. And then some of us still, you know, are teaching in physical classrooms. My child goes to school in person. And some of this we can adapt to, uh, you know, digital classrooms as well. And if we're teaching on Zoom or um, using other conferencing, uh, conferencing tech. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how schools can influence youth sexual socialization. And we actually got into that with the question. So that's a good segue. The values, policies, and codes of conduct of a school or an institution are something we can influence youth sexual socialization. So that can be um, anything from, you know, policies on whether or not um, there are certain classes or activities that are segregated by gender. It can be a school's policy on um, how you address a child who may be transitioning and not using the name that is on their birth certificate. Um, you know, codes of conduct around things like, um, touch around what happens if somebody has experienced a violation, like even codes of conduct around things like bullying are going to influence just the way that people interact with each other. It's going to influence those relationships. Um, and it's going to give kids messages about what we do and don't value in terms of our interactions. Also because there are a lot of power dynamics at play in, in schools and when we're talking about, um, I guess, educational relationships, um, and I'm going to talk about what some of those power dynamics are, uh, they can pick up a lot of ideas about just consent and navigating consent. Um, and then there are the values and policies and codes of conduct for the class. So oftentimes, um, if teachers have a regular class, they will sort of have a set of rules and expectations of their students and how they're meant to behave when they're in that class. Same thing. And then there are the personal values and ethics we bring to our teaching. So for example, I shared some of mine at the top of this presentation and talked about how, yeah, that all 
comes into the way that I present and the information I've chosen to present. As a facilitator, as an educator, I'm a curator, I'm a curator of information. And so, yeah, I got to decide what I was going to share with you. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't share. Um, my bias influences that, my values influence that. I decide what I do share and my values and bias, you know, and my, inf my perspectives influence that. And then just the way that I share it. It's all, so all of those things can really influence um, youth and their sexual socialization. So we're gonna talk about some specific aspects of sexuality. Um, and how our beliefs and attitudes might affect students. And, um, you know, if we want to be intentional, some things that we might do in our classrooms. So the first thing I want to talk about is consent, because I said, as I said, for me, this is um, a foundational element of sexuality, positive, respectful, like, awesome sexuality is consensual. So our beliefs and attitudes about consent will affect relationships between teachers and students, again, because there's a power dynamic there. Um, it will also affect relation, it can also affect the relationship between like school administrators and teachers. That's a different power dynamic that exists. And again, we just discussed it. So for example, a teacher may want to teach a certain subject or teach in a certain way. School administration, school boards, et cetera, may intervene and stop them from doing that. Um, or they may give them permission. Again, power dynamic at play. Um, there are relationships between educators and administration and then support staff. So I'm thinking about, you know, if you have um, auxiliary staff who, you know, say work in the cafeteria, janitorial staff, um, you know, people who support the school and are critical to the school being able to run and function, but are not educators. And there can be, you know, relationships between senior staff and junior staff. So, you know, maybe the head of the science department versus, you know, the new teacher just fresh out of teacher's college, um, you know, and it's their, their first week. There can be a dynamic there. And so youth are going to experience the power dynamics of the teacher-student relationship directly. Uh, as a teacher, you have a lot of power and control over what happens in your classroom and you have a lot of power and control over your students. Um, and so how you uh, exercise or don't exercise that power um, is going to teach them something about consent and power dynamics. Youth can also observe aspects of the power dynamics amongst teachers, administration, and other staff. They may also observe things like power dynamics between their teacher and their parents or their caregiver. And so I'm going to talk about ways that we can be intentional about uh, what we teach students about consent. And so I'm going to focus really only on that student-teacher relationship because that's the one that we probably have the most control over. So here are some sex positive consent practices that you uh, can bring hopefully into any classroom or to any group. So you can find opportunities to give students choice and agency in your class, particularly when we are talking about young children and young students. Um, student, children are capable of consenting, but they're not capable of consenting to everything because they don't have the developmental capacity to necessarily understand the long-term um, consequences of their choices. And so part of our responsibility as adults is to like take care of them and make sure they're relatively safe. So sometimes we can't give, like we can't give them free range all the time. Um, so you can't be like, yeah, kids, you know, there are jars of paint. If you feel like eating them, go for it because, you know, can like, it's your body, it's your choice. Uh, stop them if they're going to do something like that. Sometimes you may have to. You can't say like, yeah, sure. Like, slide down the banister at school, even though there are like, literally dozens of other small people and accidents could happen. You can't let them do everything. But you can look for opportunities to give them some choice. You know, maybe on the first day, um, you know, you could let them 
pick a desk or maybe when it's reading time, you know, you can let them, um, I remember my son had like a, a carpet with little colored circles and maybe you can say like, you can pick your color circle for the day, something like that. Um, just finding little opportunities to give them some choice. It's usually more limited in a classroom where you have like a lot of kids as opposed to what you would do if you're in a very small classroom or if you're one-on-one, -on -one. but you know, look for those opportunities. You can support students in expressing personal boundaries. And I'm thinking in particular about the fact that when kids are with each other, you often have some children who are a little bit more aggressive. They're a little bit more, um, you know, they may be like just a little bit more confident, a little bit more forceful in saying like, this is what I want, this is what I want to do. And then you have students who may struggle a little bit to sort of assert their own boundary and be like, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, and I think in particular, if you know you have students who are like, eh, they have some trouble speaking up or they're a little less um, assertive about defending a boundary, like you'll have the kid who's like, uh, you know, like one kid will say like, okay, you know, we're doing a group project and this is the topic we're, cho we're choosing. And then you'll have the kid who's like, yeah, okay, I guess if that's what you want to do. And you as the teacher sort of know, like, they don't want to do that. You can intervene and sort of help them and, you know, maybe say, like, do you want to do volcanoes for your science project? Because it sounds like you don't, you know, help them out. Um, the flip side of that is that you can redirect students who try to push boundaries with their peers. So again, if you know that you've got those students who are just like, I want what I want and I'm going to say it. And if there's another student who's a little bit more passive, I don't care. Like, I'm just going to try to, you know, coerce or convince them to do things my way. Um, you can talk to them about that and you don't have to be like angry or, you know, tell them that they're bad. But just, you know, let them know that, hey, you know, I think you know that your fellow student doesn't feel super great about doing this. And so let's not push them. Let's ask them what they want to do. Because, you know, this is a group project or, you know, you're working on this together or you're playing together. And we want to make sure that everyone feels okay about what's happening and just reminding them that that's, you know, an appropriate way to practice consent. And then another concrete one is just to ask before sharing students images, work or information. I don't know if this still happens in classrooms. I remember when I was in class, sometimes um, if you did work that the teacher liked, they would, you know, sometimes I would have a teacher who would say like, oh, you know, we had to write essays. Nadine wrote a great essay and I'm going to read it to the class. And sometimes I'd be like, yeah, read it to the class because that was amazing. And then other times I'd be like, no. Everyone's going to look at me. I don't want that. Um, you know, and I know oftentimes like teachers will have class websites or Facebook groups or whatnot. And so, yeah, if you're just going to share stuff about a student, you know, even if it's a positive thing, you know, you can just check in with them and say, hey, I think you did really great work here and I would love to share it with the class or I would love to post it um, on the class website for, you know, people to see how do you feel about that. And if they're down with it, yeah, go ahead. And if they're not, you can be like, okay, no problem. Still really proud of you, A plus work. Or A minus or whatever grade you give them, it's all good. You know, that's such a great reminder, Dr. Thornhill. And I, I find actually it's true even when we're sharing information about our colleagues. Um, you know, schools of course are, are, are like families. They are mm -hmm. micro communities and, um, you know, something that I, I think is great to model if a colleague wins an award or, you know, is engaged or has a baby or, you know, just one of these big milestones. If I'm sharing that with students, I'll often preface it by saying, you know, this teacher, you know, I, I, I said that I wanted to share this. You should know so-and-so just won this award. If you see them, you know, send them a message to say congratulations. But I find even that idea of I checked in on sharing that is just really powerful modeling. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to pause here. We've got a great question in the yeah. chat from, from Anna that, you know, again, relates to this idea of, you know, consent and and helping students, um, you know, navigate this. And, you know, and I really appreciate how you point out, you know, 
doing the best I can. I always address qu questions and comments um, as best we can. And I think, you know, educators nine times out of 10 have amazing intentions and we're, mm. we're constantly striving to do better. And uh, I just want to go back, Dr. Thornhill, to that message, that really important message you shared about, you know, sometimes we might not get it right and we've got to be okay with that. And we're trying to do better um, and we're not going to be perfect. And I, I think we hold ourselves to that high standard and just realizing um, we're not always going to be perfect. Um, so again, just turning it over to you. I was trying to give you some time to read that question at the same okay. time. And um, um, okay. So if it's okay, I'm just going to read it out for folks or actually I will ask, let me model the thing that I just said. Um, is it okay um, if I read out this question? It's a question from Anna. And if you just wanna put a little why down there, if it's okay if I read it out loud. Yeah, okay, great. That way um, folks who are watching on the recording will know what the question is. I had a student reveal a couple of times in a chat during a Google Meet that she wanted to be referred to, she wanted to be called a different name and referred to as he, him. This was during a conversation with another student, but the entire class list was reading it. Should that be something I would address with the whole class or individually? I already knew about the name change, but I felt that maybe he wanted it to be addressed. Normally I address all questions, comments as best I can. Thoughts? I think this is a great question. And what I would recommend is, perhaps, if you're not sure, I think a good general rule is to just check in with the person. And so I would check in with this student and I'm going to refer to that student as him since that's uh, apparently what, uh, how he'd like to be referred to. Um, if you can check in with him privately, um, you know, private chat, or if you're able to send him an email and just say, you know, hey, I noticed that this popped up um, in the chat would you like me, I guess the first thing you can ask is how would you like me to refer to you um, if that's in question? And then secondly, is this something you would like me to address with the class? Um, and if they say yes, then yeah, you can, you can bring it up with the class. If they say no, then that's fine. Maybe you can just reassure them that, you know, yeah, you know, if you ever do need my support or you ever do want me to address something with the class, I'm happy to do that. But if you would rather handle this yourself, that's, you know, absolutely okay too. I think uh, when we're talking about issues around, you know, gender and identity and, you know, really helping kids to feel safe, I think giving them a sense of agency is really important and letting them take the lead on you know, how they want to come out, who they want to come out to, um, what supports they need is, uh, can be really helpful for them. Oh, I'm so glad that was helpful, Anna. Fantastic. And actually, we're going to be talking about this next. So again, you guys are very intuitive with the questions. Your questions always segue really nicely into the next thing that I want to uh, bring up. So thank you for that. So we're going to talk about beliefs and attitudes about gender and sexual identity. I did do them in the same section, but gender and sexual identity are not necessarily connected. Um, for many people, they are separate aspects of their identity. Um, I have met and spoken to people who feel that um, they are there is a connection between their gender and sexual identity, but I would say don't make that assumption, I guess. You can ask the person if, you know, if they're open to sharing with you. So our beliefs and attitudes about gender and sexual identity can affect students' ideas about how they should dress, how they should behave, what constitutes a family, um, you know, what's okay or expected in terms of flirting, dating, courtship, <coughs> excuse me, you know, the relative value of genders. My personal belief and value is that the relative value of genders is equal. Um, their own worth as a human being. It can affect students' ideas about other people's worth. It can affect students' ideas about the way they experience attraction. It can also affect students' ideas about the need to experience attraction. So, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember um, who did this study, but I read it 
I think it was the Guttermacher Institute, did a study on adolescent sexual behavior and attitudes. And I, it's fairly recent, I think it was last year. And one of the most interesting aspects of that study was that the percentage of teens who are actually having sex, um, partnered sex, is it's, I believe it's less than half of like 14 to 18 year olds have had or are having partner sex. But most teens believe that most of their peers are having sex. Um, and I thought that was interesting because I think in part that speaks to this idea that, yeah, teenagers have it in their head, like, I should be wanting to have sex. I should be feeling all of these things. Again, we, we have this stereotype of, like, teenagers are just a ball of emotions, and, like, they just, you know, want to be up on each other all the time. I'm like, no, not necessarily. Um, yeah, it's okay not to experience attraction. Uh, our beliefs and attitudes about gender and sexual identity can affect the way students, um, you know, Students' ideas about how to just navigate human diversity. We're really, we're all like different and there are variations on, yeah, like the way we experience and express our gender, um, the way we experience and express sexuality. Uh, you know, sometimes it's described as existing on a spectrum. It's just, it's, it's different and there are just all these shades. And if we expand that out, that can also just affect the way students Re react and respond in their ideas about diversity in general. Again, it's it's all very nuanced. Um, and then finally, it can affect students' ideas about how to be respectful of others. Where I live in Ontario, um, we have like a relatively comprehensive sex education curriculum. It was updated a few years ago. Um, it was big. I was pro that. And one of the updates included um, a learning objective in the third grade where teachers were encouraged to teach their students and like start conversations about just difference, the way that, that people can be different from one another and the fact that there are differences that we can, we can observe and then differences that may be internal that we may not be aware of but still exist. Um, they called it like visible versus invisible differences. And when we elected a more conservative government, they repealed those uh, sex ed portions of our, it's our health and phys ed curriculum. And one of the changes that they made is that they moved that unit to the eighth grade because they felt that, because that unit opened up the possibility of talking about, you know, folks who were trans and folks who were non-binary and folks who didn't identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. And a lot of folks thought, oh, that's not a big deal. Like, it's one little thing, it's one little change. We're, we're moving it to eighth grade. And I thought that that was actually a really significant change because what, what you were sort of saying with that change was, we're not allowed to acknowledge that there's gender diversity until people are 13. And even just by making that change, you were saying something about the identities that we value versus the identities that we don't. Um, you're saying that there is something inherently problematic with people who don't identify with the gender they assign at birth. That there's just something inherently like confusing and you know upsetting to children if they know that that's a thing. Um, and again, it's happening. You know. It's not that trans and non-binary folks suddenly disappear and don't exist. And then when, you know, kids turn 13 or enter the eighth grade, they're something like, oh, I can see them now. Um, they, they exist there, they, they live, you know, in society, they're human beings just like everybody else. Um, so yeah, our beliefs and attitudes about all these things will affect, you know, the respect that youth have for people and, you know, will influence this idea that, you know, maybe there are certain people that are like, like everyone's okay, but some people are like more okay than others, which I'm not down with that. All right. So I uh, just want to shout out the Shifting Schools presentation that was, I think it was the one, like the last one um, by Sam Long, and it was Discovering Diversity in Science Education. 
And Sam went like went in on a lot of the things that I'm just going to touch on here. So I am going to encourage folks, if they haven't seen that presentation, to go back and watch that presentation because uh, then you'll get the deep dive. Um, I'm just giving you skimming the surface. We're just water skiing over this. Uh, okay, yeah, so use gender inclusive language in class. So instead of boys and girls, um, students, folks, people, um, use resources that highlight gender and sexual diversity. And then I'm going to reference another Shifting Schools presentation. It was uh, maybe two, like two or three ago, um, that was uh, Read Out Loud, Read Out Proud um, by Lisa Foreman and, uh, I, I wrote it down, uh, and uh, Beck DeMonte. Uh, lots of resources in that presentation. Introduce yourself using uh, your name and your pronouns. So if you look down there um, in my little box, uh, indoctrinating Thornhill, she, her, and um, I think I remember to use my pronouns at the beginning of the presentation. If I didn't, I apologize. My pronouns are she, her. Don't dead name students. So if you're not familiar with the term dead name, um, oftentimes if a student um, transitions, like even if they're just going through a social transition, which is usually the only type of transition available to young, younger students, um, they may pick a different name that they feel just more accurately represents their authentic gender. But on your records, you may have a name that's on their birth certificate, and that may be a different name. Um, so use the name they ask you to name, like use the name that they introduce, that they use to introduce themselves and don't worry about um, their legal name when you're talking to them or referring to them in class. And then include learning materials created by queer folks. And this can be learning materials that like about queerness, but it can also just be learning materials created by like rad queer folks in STEM or like rad queer authors who are like writing amazing literature. Like let's promote these people and get their work out there because queer folk aren't just, you know, about being queer. They also, again, are full complex human beings with a lot to contribute to society and a lot to contribute, you know, to our knowledge. So yeah, look for those resources. All right, so now we have beliefs about attitudes, bodies, and sexuality. Like, yes, this is all sexuality, but now I'm talking about stuff that's sort of more obviously sexuality. And that can affect how we deal with students who are menstruating, students who are having erections, students who are dealing with vaginal discharge. I don't know why I put a period after vaginal, that was a mistake. Um, students who are spouting, spouting pubic hair, uh, experiencing growth spurts, developing breasts, um, getting sweatier and smellier. That's Thing that happens. Um, and if we have older students, we might be dealing with students who are pregnant. We might be dealing with students who are undergoing uh, hormone therapy as part of a transition. Uh, we might be dealing with students who are managing STI symptoms. We might be dealing with students who are dealing with a yeast infection or, you know, some other sort of health issue that is affecting um, their genitals or another sexual part of their body. As I said earlier, Students are going through sexual development all the time. And a lot of these are just happening. They're happening while they're in math class. Uh, so sex positive support, we can offer uh, folks with young bodies that are just doing their things. Letting students go to the bathroom when they need to. Um, and I will remind folks, cause I think I, I'm older, I'm in my mid 40s. And so sometimes I actually forget this. Students can be, um, stu oh, sorry, on average youth go through puberty younger now than they did a generation and two generations ago. So yeah, it is possible that you, ha you might have like an older third grader who's having a period and doesn't wanna talk about it and just needs to go to the bathroom. So you can let them go to the bathroom. Um, you know, sometimes like when you're sprouting pubic hair, it's like itchy and it's getting caught in your underpants. And maybe you just want to go to the bathroom and like adjust because you don't want to do it in front of the entire class. So yeah, just let, let, let them go to the bathroom when they need to go to the bathroom. Um, this may not be possible for everyone. Again, I know that there are teachers who are like, 
under-resourced and don't have, you know, the money to get all the pencils or books that they need. But if you are able to, and if there are funds available, you can have menstrual products available um, somewhere in your class, hopefully somewhere where like maybe you can sort of get them discreetly and just to the bathroom if they need to. Uh, if you have older students, same thing you can, if you are allowed to, if you have the financial means, you could have safer sex products available, like just a little thing with like condoms and dental dam and, and you know, things like that. Um, I encourage folks to be sensitive about how students are sitting and standing and holding their bodies. I remember, uh, I remember this from being in school myself, like a lot of don't slouch, don't slouch, don't slouch. And, you know, when bodies are growing, um, when you are maybe feeling uncomfortable because like certain parts of your body is, like are getting like bigger or just, you know, aren't supporting you the way they used to. Yeah, sometimes you might slouch or sometimes, you know, you're gonna kind of do this or whatnot. Um, and I generally think it's easier for people to learn when they're comfortable. And yeah, I remember going through puberty and it was uncomfortable. Like people might be having cramps. Um, somebody might be pregnant and just, you know, trying to get through their morning sickness and they may not have revealed that they're pregnant to anybody. Um, so again, you know, sort of, as much as you are allowed to, you know, letting students be comfortable in their bodies. Um, if we are doing online learning, also maybe being sensitive about students turning off cameras or dropping off calls. Again, they may be dealing with bodily issues that they have to attend to and they don't wanna tell anybody. Um, yeah, so kind of, you know, letting them do that. And if it's happening, excessively, you know, definitely check in and, you know, see if everything's all right, um, if there's anything you can do to sort of better support them. But, you know, if it's just, you know, okay, the student just kind of disappeared for five minutes, then, you yeah, know, maybe they're just tending to a physical issue, um, a body thing. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I think, we see research all the time about psychological safety and how important it is if we're going to learn, if we're going to do anything challenging, mm -hmm. that that's really one of the most important factors. And I think, you know, if I can't go to the bathroom when I need to go to the bathroom and somebody is going to control that, I definitely would not feel psychologically safe. So I think that's important to point out. Um, yeah. We did, uh, Vanessa has asked over in the chat, and I should have said, Vanessa, do you mind if I say this out loud? Sorry, you know, that was modeled really well beforehand. <laughs> Um, you know, your, your point about puberty now starting earlier, um, I, I shared because I've done some, some reading about this because it is really interesting, um, a, a piece that I found from The Guardian, but I'm wondering if you also just want to speak um, to that and, and, you know, again, if there's any other uh, research that you would want to point to or anywhere else that you think is doing a great job of, of covering, covering that, um, the evidence behind that. Um, oh. See, now I'm drawing a blank on any research that I have. Um, there, there are a lot of, there are different theories as to why puberty is starting earlier. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. I cannot remember who wrote this. It, it was a thesis and it was fascinating um, because it was the first time I'd actually heard this. And I will have to dig through my notes. And if I can find it, I will, I'll send it to you, Tricia. And then maybe you can link it in the, the notes, the recording. Um, I believe it was a researcher out of England and she did sort of an anthropological um, dive into puberty. And what her conclusion was that in fact, puberty rates are not dropping, they are actually returning to pre-industrial, um, to like pre-industrial averages. And that what she discovered was that um, sort of in the run-up to the industrial revolution and then during the industrial revolution, because um, children and youth were being put in these incredibly arduous, physically arduous situations, um, that the average age of puberty started to rise. Like basically youth were not developing um, 
as early as we had seen previously because their health was being compromised in all of these really extreme ways and that what we're and that yeah if you look at the information that's available and of course it's um it's a little bit scant um because you know there wasn't like amazing there weren't amazing health records uh in pre-industrial times but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that yeah in sort of like pre-industrial agrarian um times and cultures that the average age of puberty was closer to what we are seeing now and so what we're seeing now is actually like a, a correction um that because children are once again like better cared for in general um have access to better health care that now they're going through puberty at an earlier age and that was interesting to me because i thought that actually makes sense like the idea that our bodies develop sooner as an indicator of robust health, as opposed to an indication of, oh, something's wrong, makes sense. The idea that, oh, they should, like, we don't want kids going through puberty is sort of more, again, socio-cultural and I think rooted in this idea that like, oh, but like it, then it's like, there's something sexual about it and we don't want kids and like sexual things happening. But from a biological standpoint, yeah, it, you would think, yeah, it's maybe more beneficial if people are people have more reproductive years um so yeah i thought that was really interesting and i'm so sorry that i can't remember the name of the person who did the research i will go to my notes and i will find that and i will send it to you um but thank you trisha for sharing um oh yeah you shared uh this link from scientific american which i don't think i have read that so i will and um, yeah, that's a great question. So for, sorry, I didn't read the question, Vanessa's question out loud. It was, why is puberty happening earlier? So the simple answer is we don't know for sure, but there are a lot of theories. Okay. Uh, sorry, I keep jumping ahead in my slides. Uh, so the last thing I will uh, talk about are beliefs and attitudes about emotions. And our beliefs and attitudes about emotions can affect the way we deal with students who may be experiencing a crush, falling, falling in love, grappling with their gender identity, grappling with their sexual identity, uh, coming out, navigating a romantic relationship, um, navigating a sexual relationship. Oh, okay, I am so sorry. I should have put a content warning and I forgot. Um, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to get into any details around um, sexual or relationship violence, but I'm gonna mention them here. I'm, I'm so sorry for not having the content warning earlier. Um, yeah, there are youth who uh, may be victims of sexual violence or abuse. They may be victims of homophobic violence or transphobic violence. Um, they may be victims of relationship violence. Um, they may be dealing with a breakup or having body image issues. And I just want to point out that as a teacher or an educator, you may or may not be aware that these are things they're going through, but these are things that students go through. Um, and again, if they are, you know, the processing of that may be happening when they're in class, you know, um, as much as we may like to, most of us can't compartmentalize our emotions. And sometimes when we do, that's not necessarily the ideal way of processing. Um, so you may be seeing um, sort of fallout or, or just behavioral shifts um due to things like this but you don't necessarily know that this is happening to them um so uh yeah just be aware of and, and sensitive to moods or behavioral shifts in your students and i'm sure anyone here who's an educator or a teacher is aware like even just like going through 2020 is a big emotional thing for youth to process um and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of folks here have noticed just behavioral changes in their students this year because the world is going through trauma right now and people process trauma differently. Um, and often emotions will crop up due to trauma and we're not even aware of, like, that there's a connection there. Um, so yeah, just to be sensitive to them. Uh, and I will also encourage folks because we're going through 2020 to, you know, be good to yourself and gentle and kind to yourself, you may also be having 
like behavioral shifts or challenges. Uh, and I should have mentioned that off the top, that we as educators may be going through any number of those things as well in our personal lives. And it may affect the way that we show up to our classrooms. Um, helping students name their feelings. This can be really, uh, really, really helpful, especially for little ones as they're you know, we can help them build that vocabulary so that they can learn to identify and express emotions. It can also be really helpful for older students too, just to be like, hey, you know, I noticed you seem kind of frustrated today. Um, and maybe that's all you, like, that's all you have to say and just be like, hey, you know, that's tough. Sometimes I get frustrated too. Uh, sometimes just having that word attached to an emotion can, can help us start to process. Uh, redirecting inappropriate behavior, but validating emotions. So if you have a student who's acting out in a way that's not okay, that, you know, might, might be in violation of, you know, the rules you set out or the boundaries you set out um, around behavior in your classroom, you know, you can say like, hey, um, listen, it is not okay to call your classmates names. I noticed you seemed angry today. And you know what? It's okay if we feel angry. It's not okay to call other people names. But um, if you want to tell me why you're angry, or you know, if you want to hit this pillow, if you have a pillow in your classroom, or you know, just give them a different outlet for expressing that, for expressing that anger. Um, you know, if you have little kids, something, something we used to do. Um, with my kid, he's okay with me telling you this, is we had a phone book because who uses a phone book? Maybe somebody, but we didn't use phone book. We, like, we were like, we don't use the phone book anymore. We just use Google. So every time we got a phone book, we would like give it to him and that was his angry book. And he could like rip it and like color in it really hard and tear the pages. And he really liked that. You can offer support. That sentence does not make any sense, sorry. Um, what that is supposed to say is you can um, offer appro any appropriate support resources that are available. If there's counseling that you have available um, that you know of, um, if there are other support services, either within the school or within the community, um, you can just, you know, let it be known that like, hey, if you need to talk to somebody, um, if you need help with this particular issue, you know, here's someone or here's some place you can go that can help if you're interested. And I think this one is key. Be honest with students about your duty to report. So I know we have folks in, in different places around the world and folks who may be watching the replay in different places. So for example, where I live in my province of Ontario, if a minor, a minor is considered to be anybody under 16, tells me that they are, um, they are the victims of physical or sexual abuse, um, from a parent, from a caregiver, whoever, legally I have a duty to report. I will, oh, if I, and sometimes, um, you know, you'll have a student or youth disclose to you without any run up and it catches you off guard. But if you sense that like a disclosure is coming, something that I am always conscious of is that reporting is not always going to be in the best interest of that youth. Um, for example, I know that here in Canada, um, black and brown youth and indigenous youth tend not to fare very well um, as uh, wards of the court, as they call them, or, um, you know, in the, like in the foster care system. And so it's something that I'm conscious of. And so and also, I just feel like that if somebody is disclosing to you, they're putting a lot of trust into in you. And so I always want to be honest and upfront and let them know, like, you can absolutely tell me that, like, tell me something if you need to. I just want you to know that if you tell me that someone is harming you, I do have to tell somebody that it's happening. Um, I also just don't want anyone to feel blindsided or betrayed by that. And I want them to have as much agency as possible um, when they are disclosing, because when somebody has been the victim of abuse, they have had their agency taken away. And I don't want to be yet another person who is violating their agency and violating the, their consent. So 
I personally feel that it's important to be honest about your duty to report and then let them make that decision. All right, and that's it for the formal presentation. So yeah, ask me questions. I think there are some in the chat. I'm trying to bring up the chat. There it is. And again, just a reminder, you know, um, if you have a question, please do make sure in the chat you're sharing panelists and attendees so that we can all see it. Um, and again, just while I'm giving folks some time to drop any questions that they that they have in that space, um, you know, thank you so much. You know, there were you just sort of went through so so many different aspects to this. And I, again, I appreciated your point about sex ed is not a single lesson; it's not a single unit, even um, because I think at least in my experience, I think that that has been the approach by many schools is to say, okay, we've done the unit, you know, we've covered it. And I loved your point about, you know, this is, this is ongoing for, for students. It's ongoing for adults, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and how, how important it is to acknowledge that that student experience is so powerful. Um, you know, I would say in the last, maybe six or seven years of my career, I have not gone through a school year without, um, you know, there being at least one student issue, um, you know, where someone's images or video is shared with the student body without their consent. And, you know, again, their, a breakup happens between two students and, um, you know, that's kind of a way of, of seeking revenge. And, you know, it, it strikes me that even though that's been happening for a while, I'm not seeing schools say, you know, what can we do when this happens? Or what can we do to try and prevent it from happening? So, you know, I do think these, these issues that really affect students and, you know, talk about a trauma, I think it's unfortunately very common and, and thinking about that reality is just really critical. So um, again, I'm not seeing any questions and I wonder if, if briefly, you know, you have any thoughts on that? You know, I, I think, I have no data around this. So if you have any data around that, or if Dr. Thornhill, that's been your experience where that's happening at many schools um, and, um, and what we might want to do about it. Yeah, so um, it's definitely something that I, I talk about and I've you know facilitated workshops and conversations with both um, parents, educators, and also youth um, around this topic. So something really interesting, um, is what I hear from youth versus what I hear from adults. And so oftentimes what I hear from adults is um, basically this idea that like we have to really impress upon youth that when they share pictures, when they share information, when they post things on the internet, that it's available for everyone. And basically this idea that like they're making themselves super vulnerable and they clearly don't understand this and we have to stop them from making themselves vulnerable in this way. When I talk to youth, one of, um, yeah, one of the things they're most passionate about is we know, like we, we know, we know we're making ourselves vulnerable. We understand how the internet works. Um, and what they will often say, like, and I, I've, you know, been really privileged to speak to some people who opened up to me about their own experience of having their, you know, I, I call it being like, their digital boundaries violated, like having stuff that they shared with someone posted or shared with people that they didn't consent to. Um, and they're, they're, yeah, there was like, I trusted this person. I trusted them. And I personally don't think that we should be penalizing or blaming youth for trusting somebody else because that's such um, a critical part of building relationships is having trust and intimacy. And I personally don't think that just because you trust someone who turns out to not be worthy of that trust, I don't think that you've done something wrong. I think you can, like, you may look back and be like, okay, I made a mistake. I wish I hadn't trusted that person. And particularly when we're younger or when we, when we may be new to relationships, we may not be as aware of you know, certain flags or certain like indications that, oh, maybe this person isn't worthy of my trust. 
But I also think that's part of growing up. And I also think this is part of being human is that we sometimes learn through experience. And so for me, what I really try to emphasize is like, listen, what I, what I wish the expectation was and what my expectation is, is that if somebody trusts you, you have an obligation to honor that trust. Um, you, yeah, if you have been given an image, if you've been given an information and you know that they gave that to you because it was for you, it's not for someone else, you always have the option to not share it and if you did share it, then you were the one who committed the violation. Um, and so, yeah, I, I personally, I don't want to discourage folks from being vulnerable. Um, I don't want to discourage folks from trying to seek connection and intimacy with other people simply because there are other folks who don't respect that. I think, yeah, make them aware. But it, like I said, most youth I talk to right off the bat, they're like, yeah, we know. Like we, we know this is a thing that can happen. Um, but I also think that a lot of us and even a lot of us as adults will make decisions, you know, hoping for the best and then it doesn't work out. And I don't think that makes us bad or stupid. I certainly don't think it makes means that we deserve, you know, some of the negative outcomes that we might experience, particularly if those negative outcomes are the result of somebody else making a, Sorry, I was about to swear. Making a crappy choice. Um, yeah. And so that's really sort of what I try to focus on is just, yeah, how can we real, like, how can I really sort of reframe this as what responsibility do we have when people share information with us? Um, what, because we can always control our own behavior. We can never control anybody else's behavior. We, we just, we can't. And so to sort of make it incumbent upon somebody else to be like, Never trust a human ever because you can't control them. I just, I don't think that's a realistic standard. I do think it's okay to say like, you can think about what you're comfortable sharing. Um, and I do think there's a conversation to be had about, you know, is somebody sort of coercing or pressuring you into like moving past your own boundary around this and what are your boundaries? Uh, so for example, I'm like, if you don't want to share nudes because you're like, I just don't want to, I'm not interested in sharing nudes. I'm not interested in sharing sexy pics. I'm not interested in sexting. I'm like, that you don't have to. Um, yeah. But, and I, yeah. You know, just going back to your, uh, the work that you've done in modeling conversations with students. I, I can't remember the, the title of this video, but I love that you model in there. You actually have students go through the process of saying no to certain things. And one mm -hmm. of those scenarios is, you know, hey, I took this photo of you. It's not sexual, but, you know, sometimes people take photos of us and we're like, I don't really want that shared. Oh, and I'm like, yeah, yeah my hair know. looks in that, whatever. Um, and having a student actually practice saying like, no, please don't post that. And I kind of think as a rehearsal, that's so powerful. That's so great. So thank you for that. Um, you know, and, and again, uh, another resource that's really helped me out in thinking about this idea of sexting, there's a great TED talk by um, Amy Adele Hasanoff, and she talks mm. about uh, safe sexting because I, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of the time we just say, oh, just don't do it. And we think that's going to end the conversation there. And, and, and the reality is like, it, especially you know now in these COVID times, it's really interesting to see people's perspectives shifting a little bit on particularly teens and sexting because now it's like, oh, well maybe like if they can sext, then they're not going to be as tempted to be with each other. Um, yeah, and when it's consensual and it's in a trusting, respectful relationship, sexting can be fun. Um, so thank okay, you, thank you for being here. And, uh, uh, I see a question. Um, what are some sensitive strategies to use when working with parents who may not agree with these sex positive practices due to religious beliefs that were implemented in the classroom? Um, love this question and <laughs> feels very relevant to my lived experience because um, I come from a very, very religious extended family. My, my parents, have been very supportive of my career, but uh, yeah, other people in my extended families who are like, wow, this, 
this is a lot, Nadine, um, and seems to run counter to our teachings. So a couple of strategies that I could suggest um, that I've used in, in conversations are to um, sort of a, like approach the conversation from a place of curiosity. And as someone who admittedly can be pretty opinionated and deeply entrenched in my own viewpoint, uh, something that I, that's been helpful for me sometimes is to go in a conversation and uh, ask like, what, like, what are, what are, what are your, some, what are some of your concerns? Like what, um, what is worrying to you? Or, you know, what are you seeing or hearing that you're afraid of? Um, May, and maybe not even say afraid of, actually, I think that's a, there's a little bit of judgment in that phrasing. So just, you know, yeah, like, I would love to hear about some of the concerns you have. Um, if there's anything worrying you, you know, please let me know, uh, you know, and letting them have the floor and just, you know, kind of vent a little bit and, uh, you know, get some stuff off of their chest. One thing that I, I hear a lot is that sometimes folks who have like particularly folks who come from say like a christian background um you know really devout christian background there may be some conflict there with um values and beliefs and something i've learned to say is like you know these are my values and beliefs these are my values and beliefs about you know queer and trans folks being you know they're they're human beings they're wonderful viable human beings like everybody else that's what i believe um, I believe that people should be able to make choices about their bodies. I, you know, and really owning those as my values and then being honest about the fact that you know, like, you know, schools are not, schools are not value free experiences. They never have been. Um, and so, yeah, owning those values as the educator, as someone who's interacting with their kid, but also reminding them like you may have different values and you are 100% welcome to and I encourage you sometimes I don't so if I don't encourage them I won't say that but I'll say you know you have different values you are allowed to talk about your values in your home you you are I can't stop you from doing that but in my class or in my workshop or in my space, I am going to talk about my values. Um, you know, and I try not to be confrontational about it, uh, but I am clear that that's what I'm going to do. And then something that, that often works, uh, or is it works for me a few times, is also pointing out that even when somebody is Christian, like, there's a good chance that even if it happens within the context of, you know, a traditional marriage, your kids are going to probably have sex, your kids have bodies. Um, and this is all valuable information they can still use. So I'm not telling your child, um, or I'm not telling your team, like you should, you know, go have sex with someone tomorrow. I'm just giving them information and, and they can choose to use that you know, if they, if that's not relevant to them until they get married, at least they still have it. And this is stuff that can really support them in having, you know, a healthy, peaceful relationship with themselves and building, you know, a great, joyful, pleasure-filled relationship with, you know, the people in their lives. And sometimes uh, that can, that can open up a really productive dialogue and sometimes it really doesn't. But you know, though, I love what you said just then about the idea of, you know, your your child essentially as a learner is going to be exposed to different perspectives, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and something else that this is maybe not the best reason, but sometimes I do find parents and caretakers can be motivated by the idea of my child will be world ready. And a big part of that, you know, is you're not always going to interact with folks who completely agree with your set of values. So, you know, as a, a proud new puppy mom, I think about it as, you know, we're told we've got to socialize dogs, right? They have yeah. to they have to experience lots of different things and not to compare children to dogs. Uh, you know, that's not what I'm what I'm saying, but I do think there's real value in 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 actually saying that. And I really appreciate, you know, you modeling just the the openness of, you know, we don't align on this. But also that's the reality of 
the world and that's going to be the reality for your child. So yeah. again, you know, Dr. Thornhill, thank you so much. Um, I'm cogniz cognizant of time and we've already uh, gone over yours. I am dropping the link to your website here in the chat. You know, if you'd like to continue uh, learning and working with Dr. Thornhill, you've got it there as well. Um, there's the link to the website as well as all of the social media. And, uh, you know, if you're on Instagram or if you're not on Instagram and you're wondering about why should I get on there from an educational <laughs> standpoint, get on there and just follow at Nadine Thornhill. And I think it'll be really eye-opening in terms of educational content that's being shared in Thank that you. social and space. I, I just got into reels so you can also see me acting the fool. Um, <laughs> enjoy that. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. I know this was long. So uh, extra thank you to those of you who hung in here with me for wow, like, well, some of you were early, some of you have been here literally for two hours, which is just wow. And you know, again, thank you so much. You know, we could be here for two more, potentially, you know, honestly, I, I think, um, the change that you are suggesting in terms of really cultivating students who have healthy sense of identity and, and the tools and the resources at their hands to be able to interact with one another in a much healthier way. I feel like that's, that's, that's really powerful. So thank you for sharing that vision and the practicalities that go along with delivering that, that type of education for, oh, for our students. Thank you so much. Well, just my best to everyone watching live and watching on the recording and uh, again, like a just huge thank you and shout out to all the teachers who have been keeping our students going, especially in this year. It's so much. And uh, I hope that all of you out there are just as safe and as happy as you can be in this just bonkers year. And that's, I, I can't think of a better final word than that one. So you, you get it. Uh, again, take care, everybody. Thanks so much for, for taking time and, and giving space to this important conversation. Uh, and of course, thank you again to our brilliant host. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, so again, if you, if you want to return back to it, you'll be able to find it on the website uh, to share it with friends also who you know would enjoy you know, this, great, this great conversation. Thanks, everybody, and take care. Bye.